And now, Nobel Prize winning physicist Steven Weinberg sat down with Book TV to talk about his most recent book, Lake Views. This interview, part of Book TV's college series, was recorded at the University of Texas at Austin. Dr. Steven Weinberg is a professor of science at the University of Texas. He is a Nobel Prize winner in physics, the National Medal of Science winner, and he is also the author of this book, Lake Views, This World and the Universe. First of all, Dr. Weinberg, what is this picture on the front of your book? That's a picture of Lake Austin as seen from our boat dock. Um, I do most of my work at home in an office overlooking the lake, and uh, so I have, a, I have a certain feeling of connection with Lake Austin. So why would a Nobel Prize winning physicist, science guy, put a lake on the front of his book? Well, it is what I look at while I'm working, but also, you know, being a scientist, especially a theoretical physicist, is a little unworldly, and um, the sounds of the lake, especially in summer, the boats going up and down the lake, playing music, um, brings me back a little bit to the real world, the world of human affairs, which is, I think, healthy. Well, you... And that's what I was trying to do in this book, in many of the essays, to uh, peep out of the ivory tower a bit and uh, have well, something to say about the real world. Well, let's peep back into the ivory tower. What is, what's the purpose of studying physics? Uh, well, there are many uh, reasons for doing it. It has enormous practical value, of course. Not the kind of physics I do. Uh, that may, at some future date, b bring some technological advances, but that's not why I do it, and I can't imagine now what they might be. Uh, there's also, in addition to that kind of practical reason, there's a grand historical program of trying to uncover the laws of nature. That is, we think that there are fundamental principles that govern everything, uh, which are at the root of all chains of explanation, so that if you ask, uh, why is uh, grass green? Uh, you can trace the answer back through a chain of explanation to some fundamental mathematical principles. We don't have them yet. We've gone pretty far toward them. We have a very satisfying theory of all the particles that make up ordinary matter and all the forces that act on those particles called the standard model. And uh, it's amazingly comprehensive. It covers almost everything we know uh, aside from gravitation. Uh, but it's not the final answer, and so we try to take the next step. Is it important to know the final answer? Oh, it is to me. <laughs> uh, to some of us, it has a transcendental importance. I mean, you could ask, is it important to uh, write symphonies or to preserve our environment. I think these things are important in themselves. Um, the importance of learning the laws of nature is a little bit vitiated by the fact that they're probably going to be expressed in mathematical terms that most people won't have the language to understand. But that changes with time also. You know, when Newton's theory of uh, gravity and motion was first developed, there were only a handful of people in the world who were able to understand it. Now it's commonplace, something that everyone who goes into engineering or science learns quite early in their education. Uh, so these things do spread out into society in general. And I think also, apart from knowing the details, there's a great value to knowing what kind of world this is, that it's a world governed by impersonal laws in which human beings play little, in fact, no essential role. I think that 
gives us a better understanding of our place in the scheme of things and it helps to free us of some of the superstitions that have bedeviled the human race. Such as? Well, I don't want to insult anyone, <laughs> but uh, the historian Trevor Roper has said that it was the scientific revolution of the 17th century that led to a sharp decline in burning witches in the 18th century. I think uh, today large parts of the world are obsessed with religious fanaticism. And I think the example of scientific knowledge, which is so difficult to win, about which we're always tentative, is a good counterexample to the certainty that people feel about their religious beliefs. But you also use the word transcendental in describing your research or your work. You see it as, as something that's transcendental. Doesn't that have religious implications? Oh, I don't think so. I think it, by transcendental I just mean something that... Um, I, I think I mean something similar to what Emerson meant by transcendental. That is something that affects us deeply, that goes to the roots of our feelings, that is not directed at get, uh, getting and spending. Professor Weinberg, one of the uh, essays you have in Lakeviews is what Einstein was wrong about. What was Einstein wrong about? Oh, a number of things. Um, I, I think one of the reasons I wrote that essay was to show uh, the spirit of science that even the, the we recognize that even the greatest of us and Einstein was certainly the greatest scientist of the 20th century, one of the greatest of all times, could be wrong about things and that we are capable of pointing that out. It's not a, Einstein's work is not a sacred text for which we're forbidden to depart from. Um, he was wrong, I think, in um, rejecting one of his own ideas. <laughs> that is, he had introduced a modification in his equations of, that govern gravitation, the general theory of relativity. It's a modification that's equivalent to saying that space is filled with an energy that affects the gravitational field everywhere in the universe and it affects the way the universe is expanding or not expanding. And uh, he introduced it actually as a means of preventing the collapse of matter under its own gravitation. Um, he wanted to have a static universe because that's what astronomers thought we had at that time. This was 1917. Um, he uh, then learned from astronomers that the universe in fact is expanding. There's no need for that modification of general relativity and he decided it was the biggest mistake of his life. Well, his mistake was to think it was a mistake because, in fact, there is such an energy in space. It's the so-called dark energy. One of the articles in the book is about the dark energy. And um, it was discovered in 1998. And Einstein would have been better to, to make his modification of general relativity and then sit back and wait, wait for events. What is dark energy? Ah, uh, I wish we knew. Uh, dark energy we know about because it is something that produces a gravitational field that's unusual because it causes distant objects to rush apart from each other ra rather than the usual attractive force of gravitation. It's an energy inherent in space itself. There's so much energy per quart of space whether there's anything in that space or not. It, it's very tiny if you count it by the quart. The amount of dark energy in the volume of the Earth is about enough to fill a gas tank. Uh, it's the energy in the gasoline that would fill a gas tank. But there's a lot of space in the universe and it adds up and it was discovered in 1998, which was, this is a discovery that was honored this year with the Nobel Prize to three astronomers. 
uh, was discovered to be driving an accelerated expansion of the universe. That is, the expansion of the universe is not only expanding, which we've known for a long time, uh, the expansion is not slowing down, as you would think, because gravity pulling things together, but is speeding up. And this, we think, can only be because of this dark energy. Steven Weinberg, you won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1979 for what? A theory um, that unified two of the basic forces of nature. Uh, we know in broad terms of four basic forces as electromagnetism, it's reasonably familiar to people, gravitation, we've known about that for a long time, and then two forces that only act inside the nucleus of the atom, the strong nuclear force that holds the particles together and the weak nuclear force that causes them to change their nature. Uh, the theory that was honored, and I shared the prize with two other people, uh, was a theory that unified um, two of these forces, the electromagnetic force and the weak nuclear force. And the prize w would not have been awarded at all, uh, except that it made some new predictions which were then verified by experiment. You say you do most of your work from your home on Lake Austin. Yes. Uh, do you teach, actively yes. teach still? I teach, uh, this term I'm teaching freshmen, uh, a course on the history of science, which I think will turn into another book. Uh, and in the next term I'll be teaching an advanced graduate course on advanced topics in quantum field theory. So I go back and forth. As a longtime professor, what's it like to be a, with the freshmen? And is this a general science course, or is this for science majors? No, it's a it's a course. We have an a, elite core curriculum. We have an elite program here called Plan Two, that uh, students I, I think largely self-select them into it, but it's more demanding. And this is one of the courses in Plan Two, that's supposed to give students who are not usually science students. Um, some feeling for the way science is done and the kind of reasoning that goes into science. And so I do little elementary algebraic calculations on the board, but it's mostly history, the history of the development of science from the early Greeks, from Thales, for instance, to uh, the scientific revolution uh, of the 17th century, and then a little bit about what happened after that. What's one of your biggest frustrations with teaching freshmen? And biggest joys? Well, you know, I don't feel too much frustration. I, uh, every morning, I teach from 9.30 to 10.45, and every morning on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and every morning, on every Tuesday and Thursday morning, I <coughs> have an adre adrenaline rush that I'm going to be on stage uh, talking to these bright kids. Um, I think it's all pleasure. I don't like marking them. That's the thing I don't like. Um, I wish that education could somehow be divorced from having to grade, give exams that are graded. But I remember myself as an undergraduate. I don't know how much work I would have done if I wasn't going to work for a grade. So I think that's probably impossible. What's one of the most common questions that your students ask you in the History of Science course? Well, they vary so much. I can't think of anything that's... Well, they, they're they very good at trying to put themselves in the frame of mind of the scientists of the past, which is difficult because the scientists of the past didn't know what we know, and even worse than that, they didn't think about what science is the way we think about it. For example, uh, the role of mathematics in exploring the world was not understood. Mathematics was regarded as something separate from physics, for example. And very often you find discussions whether you should look at questions from the point of view of physics or mathematics. We would never... So the students ask me, what were they thinking of? How could they think that way? And it's hard to answer. I don't... You know, it's very hard to put yourself in the frame of mind of an Aristotle. 
for example, who, whose thought is so different from ours. One of your earlier books, we're talking with Steven Weinberg here at the University of Texas about his book, Lake Views, The World and the Universe, published by Harvard. But one of your earlier books is The First Three Minutes. What was that about? Oh, the first three minutes is about the first three minutes. That is, the first three minutes of the universe. The, um, now, of course, when you say that, it implies that the universe had a beginning. And uh, at that time, when the book was written, we thought that there probably was a moment uh, when the universe had an infinite density, an infinite temperature, something that marked the very beginning of time. Uh, that's what we found when we traced the history of the universe backward in time using our equations to work like a movie running backward to work out what happened at earlier and earlier times. Uh, these days um, we think that there was a time very very early when the temperature of the universe was enormously high the density was enormously high, and my book was written about the three minutes that followed that moment. But that moment may not have been the beginning. There may have been an earlier period, and in fact now we think we have some evidence that there was an earlier period, a period when the universe was expanding extraordinarily rapidly, and um, which at the end produced the hot big bang. Uh, with which I started my book, The First Three Minutes. So if somebody says to you, um, or do you ever say in the beginning as when the universe began now? You, I try you to question avoid, that. I try to avoid uh, the question because we really have pretty good, good confidence in our theories, good enough confidence to trace the history of the universe back to a time when the temperature was so high that even atomic nuclei couldn't hold together. And we can work out what happened as the universe cooled and what we find is what we see in the universe today. So we know our theories are working. But if you go back earlier, much earlier, then our theories are no longer applicable. In particular, you get to a time when the temperature was so high that Einstein's theory of general relativity breaks down. It just can't make sense. And then we just don't know. We don't know if there was a beginning. Um, I, have no, I have no confidence in talking about a beginning of the universe. But I have a lot of confidence, and not just me, but astrophysicists in general have a lot of confidence in talking about the period that in that old book I called the first three minutes, even if it wasn't really the first three minutes. Professor Weinberg, if a student were to ask you, does God exist, what would you answer? Uh, and have you been asked that question before by a student? Well, I've been asked that question by other people, not usually by students. I think students regard it as, well, it's not going to be on the exam. Um, but people have asked me. I've had interviews about it. Um, I think the idea of a, well, it depends what you mean by God, of course. I mean, Einstein meant something like the laws of nature, which I, you know, have, I do think exist. But if by God you mean the God of traditional religion, uh, that is a God that cares about, has some kind of personality, some kind of intelligence, a God that cares about what human beings do, to me the idea is silly. Impersonal. The, the world is impersonal. The yes, I think, is. The, I think the world is imp governed by impersonal laws. And um, we are just in that rare part of the world where life is possible. And of course, where else would we be? Where else could we have evolved? Uh, it's a beautiful day outside today here in Austin. And you can easily... Um, convince yourself that there must be some kind of benevolence at work producing this lovely world we live in. But you know, uh, most of the universe is pretty awful and there aren't any people there for the good reason that they could not have evolved there. Uh, so I see no signs of benevolence in the world. I think we're the creatures of 
chance evolution. And uh, it's probably a good thing for the human race to grow up and realize that. And uh, Professor Weinberg, you've written this book of essays for the non-science person. Is that fair to say? Yes, they were written over the course of a decade um, and published in various periodicals, many of them in the New York Review of Books. They are for non-science uh, uh, non-scientists. They all are. And um, I hope that I succeeded in making them clear enough. I certainly try. And then f from, uh, for another non-science guy question to you, does, is there life similar to what we have here on Earth, in your view, somewhere else in the universe? Well, the universe is pretty big, and uh, I think the chances are very strong. But how, I mean, it's a big unknown question. How likely is it that if you have a planet that's about the right distance from its star so that water can be liquid on the surface, and it has a solid surface and has the right chemistry. How likely is it that life will get started there? Nobody has the slightest idea. We know the answer isn't zero. I mean, there's some chance. And since the universe has so many planets, so many galaxies, each galaxy having so many stars, most stars having planets, I think the chance is overwhelming that there is life elsewhere in the universe. But whether there's life elsewhere in our galaxy or in the immediate neighborhood of our solar system, that's an entirely different question. And um, I, have, I, don't, I can't make an educated guess. Is the speed of light the ultimate speed still? Well, uh, yes and no. The, um, the, the, much of our thinking in physics is based on the Einstein special theory of relativity which requires a maximum speed, which is also the speed of light. It's not just the speed of light, it's the speed of gravitational waves and um, anything else that has, any other kind of par particle or wave that has no mass. Uh, there is an experiment that was performed recently and announced in the press that uh, suggests that perhaps a kind of particle called neutrinos go, can go a little faster than light and um, a lot of us are very skeptical. In fact, I think even the experimentalists who did the experiment are probably skeptical that that result is going to hold up. If it does hold up, it's a tiny excess over the speed of light. Um, the uh, neutrinos are observed to tra travel from one place to another place hundreds of miles away faster than you, s the speed of light would admit by uh, uh, something like 60 billionths of a second. It's a very tiny uh, effect. My guess is it's going to go away and that we're going to find that the speed of light really is a maximum. But um, it'll be interesting if it isn't. That would be quite a revolution in science. Dr. Weinberg, what's your background? How did you get interested in this, these topics? I had a cousin, an older cousin, who uh, when I was quite 10 or 12, I don't remember, um, got tired of his chemistry set. It was a ChemCraft number five chemistry set. And um, I got it as a hand-me-down. And I got fascinated by chemistry and I started to read about chemistry. And I learned that chemicals behave the way they do because of the properties of the atoms that they're made of. And then I learned there was something called physics that you needed to study in order to understand atoms. And I somehow or other, you know, it was a slippery slope. I got sucked into it. And by the time I was in high school, I was sure I wanted to be a theoretical physicist. There were wonderful books written in the 30s and 40s on uh, science for, for non-scientists by good working scientists like George Gamow and James Jeans. And I read those books. And I can't say that I was excited because I understood them. I think I was excited because I didn't understand a lot of what I read. And it sounded so interesting. If only I could learn this stuff and understand it. Um, so my fate was sealed from high school on. 
When it comes to public policy, which you do touch on on quite a few essays in Lake Views, uh, how is the U.S. done, in your view, when it comes to public policy, science funding, et cetera, science research? Well, it did do very well for a long time. We were, uh, we were the world leaders in many areas, in elementary particle physics, in astronomy, both ground-based and space-based astronomy. I think that is all slipping away now, that um, the first sign of it was the cancellation of an elementary particle accelerator, the superconducting supercollider. It was canceled in 1993 um, by a penny-pinching Congress uh, after billions of dollars had been spent on it. Was this a, the location in Illinois that they were building? No, no. There is one in Illinois. This was going to be built in Texas. But um, my enthusiasm for it did not depend on that. I would have been enthusiastic wherever it would be built. Now, uh, a, a, a less powerful accelerator is coming into online in Europe uh, called the, the Large Hadron Yes, at CERN, the Large Hadron Collider. And that will reap some of the discoveries that would have already been made at the... But that's just one instance. Uh, now we find that NASA is cutting way back on science uh, programs uh, and uh, Congress is, is making it very difficult for things to continue at all, at all. A committee of the House of Representatives cut out all spending for the next big uh, space-based telescope that would replace the Hubble Space Telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope. That may never be built. Uh, we may end this period of great American achievement. Um, and I think it's because of a small government anti-tax mania that's afflicted uh, a large part of the American people. Um, and I think it's a tragedy. But of course, it's not a tragedy that's limited to science. It affects, it affects things that to many people are more important education and health and um, uh, our infrastructure. I think um, our country is in the grips of an obsession with cutting taxes and limiting the size of government, which I hope we outgrow. What about the end of the space shuttle program and President Bush's call to, former President Bush's call to return to manned space ex exploration? Well, one of the uh, happy things that I see in recent years in the Obama administration is cutting way back on manned spaceflight because manned spaceflight masquerades as science and has nothing to do with science, but is enormously expensive. And draws funds away from real science. One of the reasons that the superconducting supercollider was canceled in 1993 was because it was competing with the International Space Station, a uh, manned space flight program which has cost about 10 times what the accelerator would have cost and has produced nothing of scientific value. Um, I I think NASA, I think the Obama administration is more eager to cut back on the manned spaceflight program than Congress will allow. But, and I, I keep my interactions such as they are with members of Congress uh, suggest to me that they simply don't understand that putting people into space has nothing to do with exploring the universe or learning the laws of nature. Steven Weinberg, Nobel Prize winner, UT professor, author of several books, including this one, Lake Views, The World and the Universe. This picture on the front of the book is his view of Lake Austin from his boat dock. He joins us here at the University of Texas. Thank you.